Lord, we give you praise, Father. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> when we have nothing else to offer the Lord, we have a praise. We can say Hallelujah. It doesn't cost you anything to lift your hands. It cost me something. All two weeks ago, I couldn't do this. But praise be to God. Hallelujah. Amen. I gave you praise, Father. And I'm a, but Mike, I'm a little bit intimidated. When they told me Mike Larkin was going to be in the house, I said, to, why am I preaching? <laughs> why don't we have this man of renown doing what he does so well? But I'm honored to share God's word with you this morning. Amen. And I'm coming out of the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 13. So if you have your Bibles, please turn there with me, Matthew chapter 13. And we're going to speak a little bit about a parable that Jesus gave. It's a parable about the wheat and the tears. What is a parable? A parable is a practical story, often framed as a simile, used in a comparison as you would hear Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is, or the kingdom of heaven is like. But it illustrates a spiritual truth. There are all kinds of parables in the Gospels, and some of them are famous. We know of the prodigal son. We know of the good Samaritan. We know of the lost sheep. These stories draw a comparison in order to illustrate a spiritual truth. They are, if you would like, earthly stories with spiritual meanings. And in this chapter, Jesus uses parables to speak about many things. He speaks about God's plan of salvation, the work of the devil, the fickle nature of the human heart, and the greatness of the kingdom of God. And after Jesus has finished telling the first four parables, by the way, in this chapter, there was at least eight parables. And after Jesus had told the first four parables, the disciples came to him to ask him to explain one of them. And if you would notice with me in verse 36, chapter 13, verse 36, when they asked Jesus to explain a parable, they did not ask him to tell them about the sower on the seeds. They did not ask him to tell them about the mustard seed. They did not ask him to tell them about the soils. Neither did they ask them to tell about the leaven. The one they chose, when they asked him to explain, they asked him to explain the one that is the focus of our attention this morning. The parable about the wheat and the tares. Why did they choose this one over all the others? Well, while the Bible is not clear and it doesn't tell us, my guess is that this parable contains something that piqued their interest, something that troubled them. And if I'm honest with you, I'll have to tell you, there are some things in this parable that troubled me also. By the way of introduction, I want to examine the parable using the Lord's own explanation. And notice some reasons why this parable, out of the eight, he told that they caught the attention of the disciples. Let me provide some background. This, the parable tells of a, of a farmer who plants a wheat field. He uses good seed and plants and crop, plants a crop he's expecting a good harvest. However, while he and his servants sleep, his enemy entered his field and planted tears among the wheat. What are tears? Basically, they are weeds that go by the name of bearded darnel. They are also sometimes called bastard wheat. And in the very early stages of their development, tears look exactly like wheat. It is only when the plant has matured and the kernels have been formed that we are able to tell the difference between the wheat and the plant. And the servants see what's happening and they come to their master and they said, Lord, did you not plant good seeds in your field? How is it that we see tears growing up in the midst? 
And they offer, should we go and root them up? Shall we go and pull them up? And the master says to them, no, wait. Let them grow together. And when the harvest time comes, we will then go and we will have the servants separate them. And the tears will be burnt, but the wheat will be burned. My topic this morning is tears among the wheat, the lost among the saved. In explaining this parable, Jesus gives us the identities of those involved in the story. He said the sower of the good seed is the son of man, Christ. The one who sowed the seeds is the enemy, the devil. The wheat are the children of the kingdom, those who are saved. The tares are the children of the wicked one, the devil. They are the unsaved, but they have the appearance of being saved. Spiritually speaking, this is the picture of today's church. The tears are those in the church who look saved. They act saved. They sound saved. But who are in truth deceived about their salvation. They expect to go to heaven when they die. But the truth is they will end up in the hellfire. You see just like tears. The lost. Even those who act saved will end up in only one place. And I am not sure. But maybe under the sound of my voice here in the sanctuary or maybe out there online. Maybe I'm preaching to somebody who needs to hear this message today. They are the ones who think they are saved. They hope they are saved. They know the lingo of the church. They look saved. They act saved like anyone else. But they have never been really born again. They think they are weak. But indeed, they are tears. Now, I have just one objective in preaching this message. And it is that each one of us would do what the Apostle Paul commanded the Corinthians to do. He said, examine yourselves. Whether you be in the faith. Prove yourselves. Peter said something similar. He said, wherefore the rather brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. Now, doubtless, I'm sure. Many of you are going to say to me, but Brother Mickey, why do we need to preach such a message? The answer is simply this. I do not want any of us being deceived about our salvation and ending up in the wrong place. You might say, well, we are all saved. There's no need for a message like this. Truth is, you don't know. You might say, well, my mama is saved. You don't know that. You might say, my daddy is saved. You don't know that. You might say, but my children are saved. Truth is, you don't know that. Truth is, you may not even know yourself whether you are saved. And that's the point of the message today. That you would know exactly who you are, what you are believing for for salvation, who you are trusting, and where you are going. Amen? So consider this. The last survey of this country shows that there were at least 330,000, 330 million people living in this country. Do you know out of that number, over 200 million say they are Christians? They claim to be church members. They claim to be born again. Well, hear me now. If that is true, why is there still so much crime? Why is there still so much abortion? Why is there still so much drunkenness and drugs and sexual immorality? Why is there still so much hellish living in our society? If they are all saved, why are so many young people who are claiming to be Christians indulging in premarital sex just as much as the rest of the world? If all of them are saved, why are so many young people, again, those who are claiming that they are saved, choosing to shack up? Rather than do the right thing and get married. If they are all saved. Why are so many so called Christian marriages. Ending in divorce. Even amongst the clergy. The pastors and the ministers. If they are all saved. Why are so many so called.
Christians indulging in homosexual practices so openly and brazenly, bringing disrepute to the church and even the Lord. Why? If all these people claim they are saved and Christians, why is this still happening? Because the truth of the matter is that people often think they are wheat when they are tears. And this is not, probably not a message you were hoping to hear this morning. But I do believe that the Lord wants to speak to some of us today. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So if he is speaking, please let him speak. Amen. This is his word. Amen. There is a reason why the Holy Spirit chose to include this parable. And there is a reason why he has given us this message to this morning. So I beg you, do not tune out the Holy Spirit. Let him speak. Amen. You see, if you are weak this morning, this message is not going to hurt you. But if you are tears, it may just be that this is the day that the Lord is ready to speak to you. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So allow me to share some brief thoughts with you that tell what the tears and the wheat have in common, but also to point out to you what makes them so different. Let us read. Matthew chapter 13, if you will. Read in from chapter from verse 24. Another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. But while, he, while men slept, his enemy came and sowed seed amongst the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tears also. So the servants of the householder came and said to him, Sir, Didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then are the tears? He said unto them, An enemy had done this. The servant said unto him, Will thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while we gather up the tears, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tears, and bind them in bundles to burn them but gather the wheat into my barn. Notice with me, firstly, that both the wheat and the tares were planted. Both shared a common experience of having been planted. The difference in the experience is revealed in two very important ways. Firstly, the character of the seed. Obviously, the weed seed produced wheat while the tear seed produced tears. And on a spiritual level, the seed is that thing which we have placed our faith in. For the genuine believer, the seed is the gospel of grace. The truly born again person is trusting Jesus Christ alone for his salvation. The tears, on the other hand, may be trusting in any number of emotional, spiritual, or physical experiences for their salvation. What is most important here is where you have placed your faith. What is most important here is what you are depending on to bring you to heaven. What are you trusting for your salvation? There may be someone who says, well, brother, my mama assures me that when I was little, I trusted Jesus. Let me tell you, your mama cannot be sure of your salvation. You had better be dependent on the assurances, your own assurance. You cannot be dependent on the assurances of anybody else. You might, some might say, it's all kind of fuzzy, but I remember a time in my past where I believe I was saved. I want you to tell you, I want to tell you this morning that hell is going to be filled with a lot of people who have fuzzy relationships, fuzzy memories. What we need to understand that is that salvation only comes to that heart that has been convicted of sin and only after genuine repentance has taken place. Hallelujah. And I trust that you have that memory. I trust that you can look back in your past and see when that time happened in your life. And church, if you will, if you have ever been under that conviction, believe me, you will remember. It will not be a fuzzy experience. It will not be a fuzzy memory. You will know when that time came in your life. And the question that must be answered today is where is your faith? Or what are you basing your salvation on? 
If it is not in the gospel, if it is not in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, if it is not on his finished work on the cross, your hope is in vain. That is the gospel of grace. So you need to be sure of where your faith is that it is in the right one. Secondly, the character of the sower. The good seed was sown by the owner of the field. The tares were sown by the enemy. Why did the enemy do this? It was obvious to ruin the crop. And obviously it was an attack on the farmer. And Jesus identifies the enemy. He says the devil had done this. He is in the business of sowing tears among the Lord's wheat. You may say why? Because he knows that if he can place enough of the artificial among the genuine, he can devastate the crop. He knows he is in the business of undoing all that the Lord is doing. If he can fill the church with the lost church members, then he can fill hell with a multitude of deceived people. If he can mix enough goats among the sheep, then he can disrupt the harmony and the blessedness of the church. Have you noticed whenever there is trouble in the church, there is always some lost person in the mix? They are the center of it. They are the one causing all the confusion. Because Satan knows that enough lost people in the church will give the church a bad name. Why? Because the lost can only imitate the saved for so long. It wouldn't be very long before their true nature is going to be shown. The nature of the tears will come out. And what I'm trying to say to you today, church, is that you do not need, you need to base your salvation and your belief on the solid rock that is Jesus Christ and nothing else. Amen. You need to be sure beyond any doubt that you have trusted Jesus Christ and him only for your salvation. So they were both planted together. Notice also that they both grew up together. When the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tears also. There was all the activity of the wheat. Both the wheat and the tears grew. And as the wheat grows, so did the tears right alongside them. They did everything the wheat did and they looked good doing it. And I think the obvious is true. Saved people are going to grow in the Lord. If you stay in the church, if you stay in the Bible, if you stay in prayer, then you are going to grow and prosper in the things of God. But do you know also that it is possible for the lost church member to grow in the things of the Lord also? Oh yes, take the Bible for instance. This is a spiritual book. The word of God tells us that the, the carnal man cannot accept the things of the Lord. They do not understand them. Now imagine a lost person who gets deceived into thinking he or she is saved. And mind you, I'm not pointing fingers at anybody. I'm just trying to explain to you the nature of the tears. They sit under the preaching where the truths of the Bible are explained and made clear. The lost person can certainly understand the Bible. They can memorize it. They can know the Bible stories. They can possess all of the activities of the genuine believers. Tears in the church are sometimes members in the choir. They may serve as deacons and elders. Sunday school teachers, they may attend faithfully the Bible school and the prayer meetings. They may even be standing in the pulpit and preaching the word of God. But all the activity of the wheat does not mean that they are the real thing. Right. Amen. They have all the appearance of the wheat. Not only do the tears grow alongside the wheat, but they also look just like the wheat. And until they are matured completely, it is impossible to tell one from the other. If you had wheat in one hand and tears in the other, you can, could not tell which the difference. And that is the way things are sometimes in the church. We cannot always tell the difference between the genuine and the artificial. The tears in the church, they dress right, they talk right, they walk right, they give every appearance of being saved. And if you examine the real Christian and the tear, it was sometimes difficult to tell them apart. That is why we must not be quick to assume that people are saved. 
Parents, don't assume, just assume that your children are saved. Spouses, don't just assume that your others is saved. The fact is, you just don't know that unless you happen to be the Holy Spirit, and I don't think you are. So there was all the activity of the wheat. There was all the abundance of the wheat also. You see, the tears act like the wheat, and they look just like the wheat. But that is where the similarities stop. Because one thing the tear cannot do is produce fruit. And if you are open, if you would open the head of the wheat kernel, you're going to see that there are, the wheat plant, you would see wheat kernels. But if you would open the head of the wheat, the tear plant, all you would see is some black poisonous seeds. The tear could never produce fruit. And so it is with the tears in the church. They give all the external appearance of being the real deal. They look right, they act right, they talk right. But when you get right down to it, there is no fruit in their life. What do I mean by fruit? The tears will lack the things that make the genuine believer so special. They will lack the fruit of the spirit. Love, joy, peace, goodness, meekness, temperance, long-suffering. They will lack all of those things. They may be able to counterfeit it for a while, but eventually their true colors are going to be shown. The flesh is going to come out. Hallelujah. And you would see the adultery and the fornication and the, the uncleanness and the lasciviousness and the envyings and the murders and the drunkenness. And the, you would see the flesh being manifested. And it is interesting to see the response of the landowner. His counsel was to allow them to grow together until the harvest. Why? Because the roots of the tears are become intertwined with the roots of the wheat. And if the tears are pulled up, then some of the wheat will be damaged also. And the picture here is this. You and I cannot really tell the difference between the genuine and, and the artificial. And if we set ourselves up as judges and try to weed out those we think are tears, we run the risk of hurting the wheat. We run the risk of hurting the real and true believers. Judging between the real and the false is not our job. It is God's job and it must remain that way. Hallelujah. And as we see the outward appearance, you see we, you and I, we look at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. We see and we judge temporarily on the things that we see, but God sees the heart. That's what I am telling, that's what I'm saying to you. You and I cannot judge. Amen. So let me caution you against playing the Holy Spirit in the lives of those around you. You do not know who is saved and who is lost. The truth is we might even be fooled ourselves. So yes, they were both planted together and they both grew up together. But I want you to see that they both were processed together also. The landowner said, let them grow together and we will deal with it at the harvest. Eventually the day of the harvest did come. And the reapers were sent into the field to gather the tears and then the wheat. How could they tell the difference then? You see, it is easy at this stage. Because as the wheat grows up and begins to bear fruit, the top becomes heavy and the wheat plant sags down because it has become heavy with fruit. But the tears have no fruit. And so he keeps standing up proud and, 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 and strong. And it's easy then to tell the difference. And there's a picture here that is plain and clear. The genuine believer, as he grows in the Lord, he tends to become more humble and bow down before the presence of God. But not so the tear. In his pride, he's always puffed up and standing strong. Filled with his false beliefs and his foolishness. And when harvest time comes, they are going, both going to be gathered, but their ends are going to be vastly different, church. The tears are going to be burnt. They're going to be bound together and allowed to dry, and they were going to be used as kindling. They are not use, useful for anything else. For if the tears were accidentally eaten, they would become poisonous to the, to, to, to the spirit and the man. The tears are burnt, but I want you to see that the wheat are bond. The wheat was gathered and taken into the barn. And here it would be processed for human consumption. And maybe even sold for a tidy profit for the land over. He kept the wheat. 
but he had no use for the tears. And the implications here are harsh, but they are very clear. When this life has run its course, there are only two possible destinations for the human soul. Every person who lives and dies as a tear will find themselves cast into the lake of fire, so says the word of God, and be eternally separated from God. But the genuine believer, on the other hand, the wheat can look forward to going to heaven and be gathered into the Lord's house. The question is, which will it be for you? It all depends on whether you are tear or whether you are wheat. That's why, church, the message today is that we must examine ourselves. Do not, be let, do not allow yourself to be deceived all the way into hell. Because if your faith is anywhere else but in the Lord Jesus Christ, then you are a tear and you need to be saved this morning. I'm coming now to the finish line here. And as we try to bring all these thoughts together, I would like to close with something of a warning to you. Let me ask you, how are the tears made? Where do they come from? How do you think they get into the church? Well, the Lord revealed to us that it is the work of the enemy. But there are some things that you and I need to be aware of as we walk through this life. And the first one I want to tell you is that you must beware. Beware of good works. You see, it is easy to substitute good works for salvation. And often the tears are not the worst ones we can think of. Sometimes they are the best at what they do. They are busy, they are active in the church, but they are still lost. And do not let your place in the choir, do not let the job that you are doing in the church, do not let something good that you do send you off to hell. Beware of good works. Beware of good beliefs. There is a real danger in coming to a church like this. And the danger is that we tell you the truth. That much truth is preached and taught here. That it is easy to learn the doctrines of the word of God and believe the right things. When you are actually believing. You believe in what we tell you but you are not believing in the right person. Amen. And there is a real danger here. You see you can believe every word in the Bible and still go to hell. The word of God tells us that the devil, he knows the Bible, but he still trembles at it. He is not going to be saved. And it will not make a difference in your life until you bow down to the Lord in repentance for your sins and receive his atonement this morning. You see, you can believe in the blood. You could believe in the resurrection. You could believe in the incarnation. You can believe in the virgin birth. This will not help you, not until you come to Jesus. Not until you come as a lost sinner and repent of your sins. And some of you may need to do that this morning. You may have grown up under the, the sound Bible teaching, but you have never been born again. You have never had that conviction experience. You have, maybe you believe right, but you have never acted on those beliefs and you have never been saved. Don't let good doctrine send you to hell. Beware of good people. There are people all around you that will not hurt you for all the money in the world. But they would send you to hell without even realizing it. Because they tell you you are okay. They tell you don't worry. All is well. Do not let the words and the assurance of someone else serve as your foundation for salvation. Well-meaning people can send you to hell by assuring you that you are okay. You are okay. Do not be deceived. Deceived. Be personally sure of your faith. Why? Because your eternity depends on it. Beware of good feelings. Sometimes we have emotional services around here. They are pretty intense feelings those, during those services. It can be easy to feel the emotion. Some people cry. They give a testimony. Those emotional feelings cannot save your soul. I like the good feelings, but I'm not counting them. I'm not counting on them to get me to heaven. I am saved whether I'll feel like it or not because I am trusting in the one and only Savior. I am holding on to the rock. Amen. 
faith in his finished work on Calvary, his death and his resurrection. That's what I am counting on. How about you? Wheat or tear? Which are you? It is possible. Could it be possible that we have the lost right in the midst of those saved? I believe God has spoken to some of your hearts this morning. And you know, in case you may be thinking, the devil is trying to make me doubt my salvation. I doubt it. There are times when he's going to do that. There are times when you are genuinely serving the Lord and doing all that you can to grow in the Lord. He is going to come to you and he's going to tell you all in an effort to defeat you, but not in a service like this. You know why? Because if you are indeed lost and he's telling you and he's trying to deceive you, he knows he's going to lose you. If you would get up from your seat and you would come to this altar and you would get saved and you would give your life to the Lord. That's not what he wants. He knows he's going to save you. He's going to lose you. And he's going to be like cutting his own throat by trying to deceive you right now. So if you hear the voice of the Lord telling you something, that's the Holy Spirit. And if he's calling you to come and get it settled today, don't delay. Come to him because he's calling you. He has sent a word to you. He has sent an, an, an assurance to you. Do not let your position in the church stop you. If he's calling you, come. Who is coming to finish, brother? Hallelujah. I pray that you did not close off your mind. That the word of God, the Lord spoke, and if he did speak and you heard, that you listened. Hallelujah. Thank you for listening. And may the Lord bless you richly and bountifully this morning. Thank you.